Thank you, everybody, for joining us. This is really exciting. I think this is our fifth, fifth, fourth, fifth, um, one of these. And it's really nice to see some of you back and see some new faces. I am super, super excited to um, introduce Mike Boring, who was kind enough to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and do this live from the premiere. And he is going to be talking to us about um, one of his favorite shipwrecks. It might be his favorite shipwreck. I don't know. He'll tell us. Uh, the USS Emmons, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to him to share the story with you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, or uh, good morning here in uh, Okinawa. This uh, presentation is about the wreck of the USS Emmons, and uh, it's in memory of the 60 men who lost their lives on April 6, 1945, and in honor of all who served aboard the USS Emmons. Uh, there, there were a couple people from the uh, Emmons Survivor Association that expressed some interest in, in um, attending this. I don't know if they actually signed up or not, but uh, uh, so there may be a couple of people from the Emmons Association on the, uh, on the call. A little bit of history uh, about the Emmons. Uh, the Emmons was a, a Gleaves class destroyer, uh, 1,630 tons. Um, it was commissioned December 5th, 1941, just two days before Pearl Harbor. Um, uh, the bottom illustration shows you the configuration of the ship. Um, there were four uh, five-inch 38 caliber guns um, in the initial configuration. And uh, as you can see, some of the uh, annotations there where the depth charges were, 40 millimeter uh, anti-aircraft guns, the Beaufort's, uh, the Mark 37 gun director, and the 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns. And you'll see more of those as the presentation goes on. Um, it was home ported in Boston and originally had a complement of 208 men. Um, the first part of the Emmons service was in the Atlantic from 1942 to 1944. Uh, after a shakedown cruise to South America, uh, it spent uh, a good bit of time on North Atlantic convoy duty, uh, went across the Atlantic numerous times escorting convoys. Uh, did some anti-submarine patrol duty, including off the coast of North Carolina. Um, and then after the PQ-17 convoy disaster, where um, uh, most of the ships of that particular convoy were lost to the Germans, um, the uh, uh, Emmons made a um, Murmansk resupply mission that loaded with food and ammunition, and it made the uh, Murmansk run. Um, it was also an escort for the uh, battleship Iowa when it carried President Roosevelt to the Tehran Conference. And uh, most notably, uh, the Emmons participated in the landings at North Africa, Normandy, and Italy. Uh, the two paintings below were done by Dwight uh, Shepler, who was a Navy artist, and they were done um, from his illustrations at uh, D-Day in Normandy. Uh, the one on the left is Target of Opportunity, and the one on the right, Battle for Fox Green Beach. Uh, shows the, uh, the Emmons prominently in those paintings. Um, in November 1944, the Emmons returned to Boston and uh, underwent a, a retrofit uh, to a destroyer minesweeper. Um, and what they did uh, is they took the uh, aft five-inch gun off and they put some minesweeping gear back there and they also removed the torpedo um, uh, launching equipment as well to lighten the, uh, lighten the ship. And this picture is from the USS Quick uh, DMS-32, and it shows um, the, uh, where the five-inch gun was removed and the torpedo launchers and the minesweeping gear installed. So the Emmons right now only had three five-inch main guns instead of four. And uh, the uh, Emmons was uh, redeployed to uh, the Pacific, and went to Ulithi, and then departed for Okinawa on March 16, 1945. And the Battle of Okinawa was a significant battle in the Pacific. It was the largest amphibious assault um, in the Pacific and the bloodiest battle in the Pacific. Uh, there's a cornerstone of peace monument here in, uh, in Okinawa that has the names of over 240,000 people who died during the battle. Uh, and that includes 14,000 Americans, 77,000 Japanese soldiers, and 149,000 Okinawa civilians were killed during the Battle of Okinawa. And uh, lasted from April 1st to June 22nd, 82 days. And during the battle, um, the Japanese used extensive use of kamikazes or suicide planes. And uh, 
the kamikaze actually really came about initially in the Philippines. It wasn't something the Japanese used all throughout the war. It was uh, used toward the end of the war when, uh, when they were becoming more and more desperate. And the, uh, the map on the shot side shows you just kind of relationship where Okinawa is uh, to Japan. It's the, the um, uh, southernmost prefecture of Japan. It's about 350 miles south of, of uh, mainland Japan. Uh, and the, uh, the picture shows you basically the layout of Okinawa. Uh, it's 60, a little over 60 miles long, uh, lies in a northwest southeast direction. Uh, April 6, 1945, um, Japan launches a massive air attack. Uh, it's called Kuksi, and it's uh, the floating chrysanthemum is what it means. And the chrysanthemum is, um, uh, has something to do with the, the emperor and uh, Japanese history. All of the Japanese ships, warships, have a chrysanthemum emblem on the, on the bow. Um, and anyway, uh, Japan launched this attack on April 6, 1945. About 450 planes came from Kyushu, the southernmost um, island in mainland Japan, and some from uh, uh, Formosa, which is modern-day Taiwan. And uh, it was about 450 planes, and 300 of them were designated as kamikaze aircraft. Um, and the Emmons at the time was with its sister ship, the Rodman. They were operating off the uh, northern part of Okinawa, uh, providing uh, fire support for some smaller minesweepers. And at about 15.30, 3.30 in the afternoon, um, the uh, Rodman uh, was hit by the first kamikaze. And the Emmons came to the aid of the Rodman. It, um, uh, the Rodman was on fire and in, in danger of sinking. Uh, and the Emmons started to circle the Rodman uh, and provide uh, fire support while the crew of the Rodman could get their uh, the fires under control. And for the next two hours, it was intense surface-to-air and air-to-air -air combat. Um, the combat air patrol, both uh, Marine and Navy combat air patrol arrived over the scene. There were more than uh, 75 um, airplanes attacking the Emmons and the Rodman at that point. And for the next couple hours, it was um, very, very intense fire. Uh, the Emmons was credited with downing six enemy planes. <clears throat> the uh, combat air patrol was credited with downing over 50. And uh, at 17.30, about uh, 5.30 in the afternoon, uh, five kamikazes just overwhelmed the Emmons and, uh, and within the span of two minutes uh, hit the Emmons. The first one hit the fantail and uh, knocked out the uh, port side propeller and steering. Uh, the second uh, kamikaze hit the, uh, the bridge, uh, which is the nerve center of the ship. Uh, the third hit right near gun number three. Uh, in the stern, and the fourth hit in the combat information center uh, from the port side, and the fifth one hit the starboard uh, uh, area toward the bow. And uh, regardless of what, what they could do, there's no way they could save the ship. The Emmons was on fire. Uh, and this painting, by the way, is a, is a depiction of the USS uh, Lafey which was uh, done by Tom W. Freeman. It's not a, a depiction of the Emmons, but you can imagine that it was a very similar situation for the, uh, for the Emmons. Um, the uh, crew tried to fight the fire and damage until about 1930, uh, 7.30, and then finally the order was given to abandon ship. Uh, a lot of the guys had already been uh, either thrown overboard or blown overboard or had to jump overboard because of the fire. Um, the Emmons was uh, drifting toward uh, uh, an island called Kurijima. Uh, so rather than letting it potentially fall into the hands of the enemy, at uh, 317 in the morning on April 7th, uh, USS Ellison sank the Emmons with 96 five-inch rounds. Uh, the Emmons did not go down easily. Uh, 60 men were killed or missing. There's 18 killed in action and 42 missing in action. And uh, the uh, Emmons uh, received a Navy Commendation Award for the engagement. And just an excerpt from it um, is, by her own aggressiveness and courage and skill of her officers and men, USS Emmons achieved a record of gallantry in combat, reflecting the highest credit upon herself in the United States Naval Service. There were also uh, numerous uh, individual awards given out, including one Navy Cross. Um, the Emmons remained, uh, the location of the Emmons kind of remained a mystery for, for many, many years. 
Uh, I know I passed through here in the Marine Corps back in the 70s and, and knew a little bit about the history of the Battle of Okinawa and uh, I wondered what happened to all of those wrecks. And at the time, uh, it was told that, well, they were all salvaged after the war or they're, or they're in too deep a water. Um, well, in uh, September 1999, uh, Typhoon Bart, Super Typhoon Bart, hit Okinawa. And uh, shortly afterwards, oil started bubbling up uh, to the surface off the island of Korijima. And uh, the Japanese Coast Guard went out to investigate it and they, they located the wreck, um, but they didn't disclose the position. They, it was just reported in the paper that a wreck was found, but they didn't exactly say where it was located. Um, but some American divers kind of picked up on the newspaper reports and over the next year, they uh, did multiple exploratory dives looking for uh, the wreck and they finally discovered it on February 19th in 2001 in 150 feet of water, 45 meters of water. And the divers who discovered it um, were Rich Ruth, Jack Martin, Tammy Clark, and Steve Tomlin. The uh, illustration on the bottom shows you the way the, the wreck is laying right now. This was done by the Kishu University. Uh, it was done several years after the wreck was found. The wreck lies on its starboard side, um, and it's still very, very much intact. It's probably the most intact, one of the most intact warships that I've ever, ever dived. And it, it'll shows you there where the uh, five-inch guns are, the Mark 37 targeting director, and the mine sweeping cable reel, and you can see the uh, stern and the rudder is just off to the uh, off to the side. Um, I think uh, what happened is the, the Emmons sank stern first and it hit the, when it hit the bottom, the stern broke off um, because it was drifting for numerous hours before the Ellison sank it. So uh, it's, I, I can't imagine that the stern uh, fell off and then uh, uh, ended up in, the, in a location like that. So I think it broke off when the, uh, when the wreck hit the bottom. Um, Give you an idea of where the, uh, the Emmons is located. Again, uh, the map on the right, or the picture on the right, shows you uh, uh, the island of Okinawa, and uh, the uh, off the uh, northern part of it, uh, there's an island called Korijima. And uh, in the upper left-hand photograph, you see Korijima in the background. And uh, the wreck is not very far offshore. And the boats that we use to dive it are are basically what you see right here. They're small, open boats. Um, it's a brutal 20 minute boat ride. Uh, none of this leaving at midnight and driving all night to get to the wreck. It's a 20 minute ride um, uh, to where the uh, wreck is located at. And the, uh, the boats that, that uh, there are a couple of boats that actually run uh, trips to the uh, Emmons. Um, there's one Japanese uh, gentleman who runs out of Korijima and then uh, North Anago Charters. Uh, Runs, it's who I usually go with when I go out there. Um, the, we're, we'll start looking at the wreck from the, the bow, uh, work our way back to the stern on the outside of the wreck, and then we'll take a look at uh, the inside of the wreck as well. The most prominent features on the, on the bow are the two five-inch guns. Um, and it gives you an idea here. You can see the ships lying on its side. And uh, the picture in the upper right-hand corner was taken actually in Scapa Flow, uh, when the uh, Emmons was on uh, uh, escort duty, they were piping a British Lord aboard. Uh, but you can see the, the two five-inch guns. You can see the bridge uh, in the background of the number two gun. And uh, on the bottom there, it gives you, uh, shows you the, uh, the guns and the diver there to give you some perspective. Um, as you can see, the diving conditions on, <clears throat> on the Emmons are, is really pretty spectacular. Uh, we've got warm, clear water. Um, we're looking at, you know, oftentimes 100 foot of visibility or better. Uh, in the dead of the summer, the water is close to 80 degrees. In the winter, it's about 70. Um, it's very, very, uh, very nice diving conditions. Um, <clears throat> this gives you an indication of what it looks like inside the uh, handling room for the uh, five inch guns. On the uh, top left picture, you see some of the five-inch shells still in the uh, in the ready uh, position there. Um, the the uh, firefight that was going on with the Emmons, they expended most of their ammunition. They were uh, running 
virtually running out of ammunition and they were using everything instead of even five inch shells that have proximity fuses for anti-aircraft they were firing phosphorus they were firing armor piercing shells anything they had left and here's some shells that were that had not been used um, in the uh, lower uh, left hand picture you see the uh, ammunition hoist <clears throat> and there's a powder keg uh, coming up through the ammunition hoist so when uh, uh, one of the uh, kamikazes hit and uh, created a fire in this area where the uh, uh, gun control room was at um, there was a powder keg coming up through the uh, ammunition hoist you can see on the picture in the, the middle there some of the powder kegs in the in the background and then the uh, the central column which um, controls the uh, uh, rotation of the gun. Um, this after the number two gun, uh, the next area of interest is the pilot house. And uh, in the upper right hand picture is a picture of the uh, USS Ellison on uh, the front of the bridge, which uh, was a sister ship to the uh, to the Ammons. Uh, so it gives you an idea what the bridge looked like. In the upper left hand picture, you can see down on the sand the curved curvature of the, uh, the bridge. That's the, the actual front of the, uh, the bridge. Um, and in the, uh, in the kamikaze attack, basically all of the bridge gear was destroyed. Um, I've, I've not found any evidence of uh, helm or telegraph. And as you can see in the lower right hand picture, these were substantial pieces of metal. Um, so I'm surprised uh, that they're not visible and they're probably buried under some of the debris that's, uh, that's there. Um, you can see the, uh, in the upper left-hand picture um, how the, the whole top of the superstructure has just kind of fallen off and collapsed. And you can see one of the uh, 20 millimeter anti-aircraft guns uh, up in that picture. And then uh, on the lower left picture, you see the curved front of the bridge uh, with two divers, and in the background you have the, uh, the gun director. Uh, the Mark 37 gun director is a very prominent feature of the wreck, and this is the, the um, device that was used to control the five-inch guns uh, when they were working in automatic mode. The guns could also be controlled locally if something happened between the, um, the gun director and the guns themselves, but uh, when everything was operating normally, uh, the gun crews themselves just manned the guns and they were controlled by the, uh, the Mark 37 gun director. And you can see the ports um, that the guys would have been looking through. And the, the illustration on the right hand side shows there's five guys inside the gun director. And uh, the picture on the lower right shows you where the gun director was at. And I can only imagine uh, what it was like to be in there in rough seas because these, these destroyers were notoriously top heavy and they, they rolled pretty bad. So I can imagine that that was a pretty rough ride when, uh, when the seas were rough. <clears throat> um, just after the, uh, the bridge area, um, you can see uh, the 20 millimeter anti-aircraft gun and, uh, and you can see the, the very uh, back end of the number two five inch gun on the top left uh, left hand picture and on the uh, top right hand picture uh, that's one of the stacks um, uh, and there's virtually almost I have not been able to find a way to get into the engine room um, the picture on the lower right shows you it's they call it a scuttle and uh, <clears throat> the way these ships were designed there were no cross bulkheads that would allow you to get into the engine room from uh, either fore or aft. You had to go through these scuttles to get there and there's no way that I can fit through there with scuba gear. Um, uh, they're pretty pretty small so the engine room to my knowledge is never no one's ever seen the inside of the engine room since it sank. And uh, the uh, lower left hand photograph kind of gives you more of a, a view from a distance of the uh, midships section where the bridge fell off and the Mark 37 director uh, in the foreground. <clears throat> After that, you have the, uh, the 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, the Beaufort's, um, and they're still uh, still in place. The starboard side uh, Beaufort, which is the one on the bottom, um, is kind of fallen off and resting on the sand. 
um, but the uh, port side one is still in place. <clears throat> and uh, just forward of the Beaufort's, you have the Mark 51 fire control systems. And the, the Beaufort's were actually controlled by the uh, by guys standing at the uh, fire control system. And uh, they would uh, do the aiming of the gun and moving of the gun, which were controlled by uh, electrical circuits. And uh, uh, the guns could also be switched to local mode in the event that the fire control system failed. <coughs> Excuse me, the picture on the right um, shows you what one of the Beauforts would have looked like, uh, not underwater. And in the background, that happens to be a picture of the, of the Emmons. And the lower right hand picture is another, another view of the uh, 40 millimeter anti aircraft gun. And the diver in the background is over the aft uh, three inch gun, or uh, aft five inch gun. Um, this gives you a view from basically from the, uh, uh, the 40 millimeters back to the uh, aft uh, five inch gun. And uh, a couple of things to note here, there's, um, uh, there was a compass binnacle that was uh, lying on the deck that had fallen over and it was just hanging by some electrical cables that were used for the light and the degaussing system. And, um, and then in the sand right there is an engine order telegraph. This was a uh, kind of a secondary uh, uh, control station uh, between the, uh, the aft uh, five inch gun and the Beaufort. <clears throat> Um, on the upper left-hand picture, you've got a picture of the compass binnacle. Last year it fell off and uh, it uh, actually fell under the, um, uh, or almost under the, uh, the starboard side uh, 40 millimeter gun. And uh, Kurt Reese, uh, a guy who I dive with here a lot, um, uh, is kind of the liaison between the, the uh, Emmons Association and the Naval Historical Center. Uh, we did get permission to move the binnacle um, out of the way of the uh, of the 40 millimeter gun because when the eventually when the port side gun falls, it's going to end up right on top of the binnacle, and uh, the binnacle has the compass still inside of it. Um, and so we uh, we made one attempt to actually try to move it, but we had a bag break off, and uh, we didn't get it very far. But uh, we're going to move it out toward where the uh, engine telegraph is. So. Uh, when it does, uh, when it does fall, it's not going to damage the binnacle. And the upper right-hand picture is a picture of looks like a big torpedo, but it's <clears throat> actually a paravane, and it's part of the uh, the, the uh, mine sweeping equipment. Uh, lower left picture is a picture of of um, the uh, crew uh, uh, washroom in the stern. Um, you can see all the sinks on one side, and there's toilets on the on the other side. On the, the uh, lower right hand picture is uh, the, the mine sweeping reel, the big cable reel uh, that was actually blown off the, or well, it fell off when uh, the ship sank, but it was actually dislodged when one of the um, kamikazes hit it. And it's off to the wreck uh, about 20, 30 feet away from the wreck. And uh, also out there, which I, and I don't have a picture of it, is um, an engine from uh, one of the kamikazes. One of the kamikazes was still on the on the ship when the ship sank and it rolled off uh, when the Emmons went down and the engine is uh, basically all that remains of it now and you can see the stern is is broken off um, on the left hand picture you see the two props um, and in the upper right hand picture you can see from the uh, from the aft gun uh, to where the uh, where the stern is broken off and the, the very uh, transom stern is about 50 feet away from the wreck and it's upside down. Uh, you can see the rudder on the uh, lower right uh, picture and then in the background you can see the, the stern and the prop as well back there, one of the props. Uh, now we're gonna, we'll take a look at what the inside of the, the wreck looks like uh, working our way aft back up to the, uh, toward the bow. And uh, in any penetration of the wreck, we always keep in mind with due most respect for the, the men who were lost on the, uh, on the wreck when it went down. Um, the, uh, this is the aft crew, crew uh, berthing area. And you can, you can see the mattresses and the bunk frames and also the storage lockers. That's where all of their personal effects uh, would be. Um, 
these guys were jammed in there pretty tight and they didn't have a whole lot of room. And I turned these pictures uh, 90 degrees just to give a better orientation because the, the ship is on its side. Uh, but this gives you an idea of what uh, those areas look like right now. And uh, further forward, you have the galley, um, which uh, is really kind of a, an interesting area. Um, on the upper left-hand picture, you see uh, the big kettles for cooking, and you see a food mixer there. And the picture on the upper right was taken uh, not from the Emmons, but from a, another ship from the same class of destroyers. And you can see the kettles and the mixer. It's a little different configuration, but uh, basically the same equipment. And the, uh, the lower left uh, corner, uh, you can see also from a Gleaves class destroyer, um, the, uh, the galley and the griddle. And uh, in the right hand picture shows you what it looks like today. And you can see the, the drawers in the table. And there's a colander hanging up on a hook um, uh, there too, which is kind of kind of interesting. And again, these, these pictures are, are rotated 90 degrees. So to provide better orientation. Um, inside the, the forward crew berthing area and mess quarters, um, which is one deck down from the main deck, um, it's uh, kind of a scene of complete destruction in here. Um, this, was, this area was all on fire um, and a number of people, there's some interesting stories in the uh, survivors reports about escaping from this area. Um, in the upper left-hand picture, you get an idea of what one of the one of the rooms would look like. Uh, in the right-hand picture, you can see the squares are actually tabletops, um, uh, and also in this area were bunks. This area was served a dual purpose. Not only was a, a mess area for eating, but also was a birthing area for the crew. And um, in the uh, you can see a cabinet there that's full of uh, white porcelain bowls. Um, and this was uh, uh, because it was where, where they would uh, eat at. There were mess trays and bowls and cups and various other, uh, other uh, pieces of china in there. <clears throat> and the, uh, the lower left picture, uh, you can see several cabinets um, that are still relatively intact. You can see a uh, bunk on the left-hand side there. And, uh, and then in the lower right picture, you can see uh, there's another view from the other angle of that uh, cabinet with all the bowls in it and uh, bunks. Um, and also uh, directly above, I don't, don't have a good picture of it, but uh, there's quite a bit of oil trapped in that area. Um, so uh, there's still a good bit of oil left on the, uh, on the Ammons. Uh, this is in an officer's stateroom. <coughs> uh, this would have been pretty much directly under the bridge in the main deck. And the picture on the left is the orientation it is uh, as you're looking at it on its, on it, with the wreck being on its side. And then I rotated the pictures to give you a little better uh, orientation for it. But the, the top right-hand picture is, is, would have been a similar uh, stateroom for, uh, for an officer. They usually have two, two uh, men per room. You can see the sink in there, and um, and then in the lower pictures, uh, you can see the, uh, the sink in the medicine cabinet, <clears throat> and right next to the medicine cabinet, there's still a glass in the glass holder there, and again, that's on its completely on its side. It's just kind of amazing that that's still there, and then uh, there's a, another picture taken from the destroyer archives that shows you what that area would look like um, not being underwater. Um, this is in the, the wardroom. <clears throat> uh, the picture in the upper left is uh, the uh, wardroom table, which uh, uh, you can see in the right-hand picture of, uh, uh, this is a, an area typically, this is the area where the officers would uh, eat. Uh, it was also a battle dressing station for wounded um, when the uh, kamikaze attack was going on. And then the left-hand picture, you can still see the, the wooden base of the uh, table is still very, very much intact. It's a, it's a pretty substantial piece of wood. And the uh, item sitting on top of it is actually a bench that would have been on the port side of the wardroom that's fallen off and uh, is resting on where the top of the table is. You can see some chairs, <coughs> excuse me, still there. 
Um, uh, and again, the, this picture is orientated 90 degrees, uh, but you can see all of the debris and, and things that have fallen down to the starboard side of the wreck. On the, the lower left-hand picture um, is looking directly up at the port side of the, uh, the ward room. And um, there is a, a cabinet there, a shelf there, and it's, it has vinyl uh, phonograph records in it. Um, it. It took me a while to try to figure out what, that, uh, what they were actually, um, but uh, that's what they are, they're vinyl phonograph records. Um, also, inside the, the wardroom, just forward of the table, um, again, you're looking at it at not, uh, rotated 90 degrees. You can see um, uh, basically looking at a wall in front of you there, and on the upper uh, right hand part is a, uh, a clock, and the hands of the clock were stuck at 317, which is uh, when the Emmons uh, went down after being sunk by the Ellison. Uh, in, the, in the upper left there, you can see uh, there's a, either a heater or some, some sort of electrical device right there. And then there's a whole series of shelves that have items in it in the middle. Um, there are uh, some bottles, uh, looks like medicine bottles of sort. There's uh, uh, at least one Coke bottle in there. And just to the right of the Coke bottles, there are some glass slides, and I, I don't know what they are, but I can read some of them, and one of them says Carolina on it. Um, I, I want to get some more close-up pictures of those to see if I can figure out what they are, but it's like a glass slide. And then the uh, upper or the lower uh, right-hand corner is a picture of a battle lantern um, hanging on the wall. And these are just some of my favorite uh, uh, shots taken on the outside of the ship. We did a, a dive there uh, last year and uh, we got in the water just as it was getting dark and for about five minutes the water was the most incredible cobalt blue uh, that I've ever seen and uh, just for a few minutes I was able to capture these images um, while the, before the water turned completely black. Um, and each year, well, back in uh, 19 or 2003, um, uh, there was a, uh, a Marine a Lieutenant Colonel here uh, uh, named John Chandler, and he was uh, uh, working with the uh, Emmons Survivor Association, and they came up with the idea of, of uh, having a plaque uh, to honor the uh, shipmates that were lost uh, on April 6th. And uh, the Emmons Association raised the money for a plaque and uh, it was put on the wreck in 2003. Um, and each year, uh, uh, Chuck DeSarci from, uh, sorry, from uh, North Inago's Charters sponsors an Emmons Memorial Dive uh, and go out there uh, as close to the anniversary of the sinking as, as weather permits. And uh, uh, a flag is deployed on the wreck and a wreath is, is placed on, uh, uh, above the uh, plaque. Uh, above the uh, memorial plaque, there's a, you actually see a replica of the builder's plaque. And it's kind of an interesting story there. Um, not long after the Emmons was found, uh, the builder's plaque was in, in the wardroom and it was still attached to the wall. And um, a friend of mine, Kurt Reese, was going to take someone in there to, to show it to him, and they got in there and it was gone. Uh, and the, the wreck is protected. Uh, uh, by the Sunken Military Craft Act, so you can't really take artifacts from it. Uh, so anyway, it was reported and they've got, they got NCIS involved and uh, there was a lot of pressure put on the uh, local diving community to, for whoever took the plaque to return it. And, uh, and ironically, it showed up uh, in the mail from an anonymous source and uh, it was uh, uh, basically uh, NCIS took possession of the plaque and uh, but uh, my friend Kurt actually uh, had some pictures of the plaque before it was removed and had some replicas made. So the replica of the builder's plaque, which is, which is also depicted in the picture on the right, is um, uh, a replica of what the builder's plaque would have looked like. And the picture in the lower left shows the, uh, uh, one of the memorial dives. This was from last year. And, uh, uh, two, of the, two of the guys that I met here in Okinawa, and I consider them probably really the caretakers of the Emmons, uh, 
Kurt Reese and Chuck DeCesari. And, uh, and this is a, uh, uh, well, let me back up a second about the plaque. The, uh, the original plaque was starting to get corroded. Um, it's a bronze plaque and uh, it was kind of in bad shape. So last year we started a GoFundMe campaign and we raised enough money to have a, to have a new plaque made. And this was the, uh, the plaque after it was, uh, after it was made. It's a duplicate of the original one. The original ones uh, uh, was recovered and it's gonna eventually be in uh, the USS Simmons Training Center up at uh, Camp Schwab. This is uh, Kurt and Chuck. And uh, last month we, we uh, got the new plaque and uh, another replica of the builder's plaque uh, mounted and uh, we, a group of us took it out to the, uh, out to the Emmons and put it in place and recovered the, uh, the old plaque as well. So this is the, the new plaque uh, as it looks today. Um, and the interesting thing about, about any shipwreck, and I, and I know you guys know this who've been diving wrecks a long time, is the story behind the, the ships itself. Um, the people, the experiences that they went through and uh, the ordeal that they uh, had to go through when the, when the ship actually went down. And the USS Emmons Association, um, uh, initially right after the war, none of these guys really wanted to, to talk about the war. Like most people from that generation, they came back and just got on with their lives. Um, but in 1953, they had their first uh, reunion. Um, and uh, this was, uh, it was in uh, Boston. And the picture on the top is, they had 60 guys there along with a few of the wives. And, uh, and the lower picture uh, is from 2019. Um, and there were four members of the uh, Emmons Association for that, uh, for that reunion. And uh, of all the things that I've read, there was this Ray Quinn, who was a gunner's mate, third class, um, uh, what he wrote. And he said, I know we griped to complain at just about everything, but as we sat in the rescue craft and took a look back at our proud ship, part of each one of us stayed with her. And I think that just sums it up for so many of the, the uh, survivors as well as uh, divers who come along later and try to learn the story and you know, have some sense of appreciation for what, what they went through. And that's it. That's, uh, that's what I've got on the USS Emmons. It's a, a fascinating story, fascinating wreck to dive. And uh, uh, if any friends, Want to come to Okinawa to dive it? We'd love to try to get you on it. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure what we do now here. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the photographs are stunning. Um, does anybody have any questions? I didn't see any questions in the chat, but if anybody has any questions and you either want to put them in there or unmute yourself and ask um, questions, I I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, this is Joyce Steinmetz, and um, Mike, that was great. That was super. Um, Thank you, Joyce. The juxtaposition of the archival photographs and the underwater photographs and turning them. I'm sitting here with a magnifying glass looking, <laughs> <laughs> comparing everything. It was great. <laughs> really good. Um, has, have the Elvis survivors, um, have, or, or of the folks that are no longer with us, have any of them been recorded by, say, StoryCorp or anything like that? interviewed about their times on the ship uh, as the ship was going down, anything like that? Anything that captures their verbal impressions of what happened back then? Yes, and I'm glad you brought that up. I meant to, to discuss that. If you go to the USS Emmons.org, um, it's the Emmons Association's page and they have um, a link to some testimonials from the survivors and uh, absolutely fascinating to listen to. Uh, highly recommend it. Um, there's also uh, an excellent book. Um, uh, there's an excellent book uh, by one of the captains in the Ammon, Ammons uh, uh, called the Ammons Saga, uh, which is really fascinating story. Um, but uh, the, the Ammons Association website has lots of pictures of the Ammons uh, and has the testimonial of the uh, of some of the survivors, which the stories are absolutely. Uh, just incredible to listen to uh, what these guys went through. So I'm glad you asked that, Joyce. Thank you. 
I was just wondering if um, some of those personal effects, especially the slides, if that person was, um, I think the slides were in the personal effects area or not? They were in a drawer that would have been in a, in a cabin, yes. Yeah, I wonder if you could relate those back to the actual person who brought them on board. That would be fascinating to do. Um, yeah. uh, all, of the, all of the area in the, uh, in the birthing quarters, uh, all of the personal possessions that these guys had were basically in those transom lockers. Okay. Um, and they're all still very, very much contained. Mike, this is Tom Hoffman, if I may interrupt. Yes, sir. Thank good you, Tom. To, good to see you. And thanks so much for what you guys are doing for us here. And what you do day in and day out, watching over the ship and, and for the shipmates. Um, uh, we just can't say enough for wh what it means to us. And we know you don't do it for the recognition. You know you do it out of respect for the guys. Um, so on behalf of all the Emmons family, your family, we say thank you. Joyce, I just wanted to, uh, to follow up on that regarding that day. Um, we do have a, there is a survivor's uh, report booklet that we have. It's a number of um, survivor accounts, handwritten accounts that were done as the shipmates were being evacuated from Okinawa um, aboard the USS Wayne. Um, up until now, it's been a booklet of handwritten copies, very faded, difficult to read copies of these handwritten reports. And um, we're close to finishing up a new edition, thanks to uh, Sherry Yecki, um, relative of one of the shipmates that was lost at, um, at Okinawa. Um, it's going to have all the original handwritten accounts, as well as a transcribed typed uh, uh, reading of, of everything that'll be much easier to read. And we hope to have that ready uh, by this fall. So you have to keep an eye on our website um, because we'll be uh, making that available to anyone who wants a copy. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. And, and again, Mike, thank you. And, and, and to you and Kurt and Chuck and um, all of you out there, uh, we really appreciate all that, that's done. I should note too, Tom's father, uh, Ed, was, uh, was in the bridge, on the bridge of the Emmons when it was hit by the kamikazes. And uh, his uh, one of uh, the videos of his testimony is on the uh, website, and it's it's very very uh, interesting, and uh, I highly recommend listening to it. Um, give you an idea what they uh, what they went through. Oh, the other thing I wanted to mention was um, I was seeing like several things. Looks like they're they're falling off the walls, and I realize it's a protected wreck, um, but. Um, underneath the Chelsea clock, there's something you may want to just put a piece of tape there in case it falls. There should be a commemorative coin underneath there, and that would be wonderful for the survivors to have. Interesting to know, Joyce. I didn't know that. Yeah. But you're, you're right. I mean, uh, has the wreck decays. I mean, salt water is not a preservative by any stretch of the imagination. And, and uh, um, where the Emmons rests, even though it's in 150 feet of water, it does get quite a bit of, of um, uh, exposure to heavy seas. Um, and it's, it's amazing that it's uh, remarkable that it's in the shape that it is in now. But eventually, uh, so many of those artifacts will, will be lost. Um, they're not photographed and, and even possibly recovered. So if any, anybody have any other questions? Well, thank you so much, Mike. That was amazing. And I think one of the most amazing things about it is when you look at the comments and you realize how touched people are by your dedication to this this wreck and um, the community that has formed around it. Like so many of the shipwrecks that we explore, they, they really bring people together in a way that is special and unique to every single wreck. So thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and for your continued efforts to preserve this wreck. Um, I am so really excited to announce that next week, because one boring was not enough, <laughs> <next week. laughs> we have a presentation from Mike's daughter, Becca Boring. Um, and I was saying to Mike before we started this, that every season, we end dive season, and all the guys look at each other and go, man, 
we wish we took better pictures this year. <laughs> and every year they don't take better pictures. So Becca has been kind enough to next week at the same time, six o'clock, do a presentation for us on tips and tricks for wreck divers who are not photographers, but <laughs> want to take better pictures. <laughs> So we are going to be posting that, as we usually do, right after uh, we, we close this presentation down. We'll post that, and we hope you can all join us next week. We're going to have back-to-back -back borings, as Karen Flynn said. How good is that? And I can't imagine anything better. Join us next week at 6 o'clock for Becca, and I'll post that right now. As soon as we're done, you can sign up. Um, and once again, thank you so much, Mike for sharing this with us. We are My definitely pleasure. gonna ask you to share something else. <laughs> and um, thank all of you for joining us. Jen, thank you. Hey, thank you everyone.